Chickamauga is going to be an essential battle for both Braxton Bragg's career and the Confederacy. The sun is setting on Gettysburg, a battleground stained with the valor and sacrifice of the Texas Brigade. Amidst the echoes of the now silent cannons, the brigade, weary yet resolute, retreats, leaving behind the hallowed grounds they fought for. Their valor echoes through history, a testament to the bravery in the face of adversity. They are headed back to Virginia. For Hood's Texas Brigade, the retreat from Gettysburg began on July 4th of 1863. Over the next several days, they traipsed toward the Potomac River along with the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia. It's a very miserable retreat. It had rained heavily on July 4th. It would rain several more times. Uh, the roads were very muddy. Uh, the troops were exhausted. Remember, they had been on the move since July 1st. They had been fighting, you know, all through July 2nd, part of July 3rd. Uh, the men were in pretty rough shape. Their uniforms were in rough shape. Their shoes were in rough shape. They had gotten very little in the way of food, uh, no meat rations whatsoever, very little uh, bread, uh, so, and, and no time to stop and cook anything. So they were, uh, you know, sort of eating on, on the march, uh, as it were. Uh, they reached the Potomac and uh, discovered that it had been uh, flooded. Val Giles, who was now a fourth sergeant in Company B of the 4th Texas, wrote in his book Rags and Hope that it was raining and that there was a tremendous lightning storm as they approached and crossed the Potomac River on July the 14th. The great northern invasion was over, and the Texas Brigade would never again cross the Potomac. Uh, and then they moved down the Valley Turnpike uh, to Bunker Hill, and Darksville. So Ewell's Corps stopped at Darksville, about five miles north of Bunker Hill, uh, where Hill's Corps and Longstreet's Corps uh, went into camp. Uh, the troops would stay there uh, for several days, uh, resting, uh, refitting, uh, a pause that would allow the 4,000 federal prisoners and the 20,000 head of sheep and the 23,000, you know, uh, cattle that they had brought in uh, to Virginia from Pennsylvania to get down the valley and out of the way of the army. Uh, the uh, Confederate army began to move through Chester's Gap uh, on the uh, 22nd of July. Uh, Hood's Brigade, for a brief time, uh, went into Manassas Gap on that day. Uh, to relieve the troops who had fought there the previous day on July 21st. Uh, and while they were in that, uh, that position, uh, one of their officers, Captain John Woodward of the 1st Texas, uh, was struck in the hip by a long-range sniper round. Uh, and that turned out to be a mortal wound. So they saw no combat here, but they lost a very good officer. Uh, the Confederates under Longstreet began to move through Manassas Gap uh, in force on the 22nd after they knocked some federal cavalry out of the way. Uh, they would be through the gap by the 23rd and by the 24th, they would be back in Culpeper County around Culpeper Courthouse. They'd stay there for about a week, then they would cross the Rapidan River. The Texas Brigade would go back to its old haunts around Raccoon Ford and would basically be in that position until the middle of September uh, when the decision was made uh, to forego a counteroffensive against Meade, which Robert E. Lee was advocating in favor of sending part of Longstreet's division, Hood's, uh, Longstreet's Corps, Hood's division with the Texas Brigade uh, to Georgia to reinforce Bragg in an attempt to recapture uh, Ch Chattanooga. What's fascinating to me about Chickamauga is Davis seems to agree that this is an all or nothing gamble. Now, Robert E. Lee is arguing with him. He does not want to detach any troops. He certainly doesn't want to go west himself, which is something Davis suggests. Instead, Davis will have to settle for giving Braxton Bragg the largest concentration of Confederate troops from different theaters, departments, divisions that was ever accomplished during the war. There'll be troops coming from Mississippi. There'll be troops coming from South Carolina. 
Of course, we know there'll be the most of Longstreet's, James Longstreet's first corps from Virginia, and that, of course, includes Hood's Texas Brigade. So at Chickamauga, Bragg has an amazing assembly of Confederate forces brought to him on those railroads that are so vital. With the decision made to send Hood's and McClaw's divisions to Georgia, the Texas Brigade broke camp and marched to Richmond on September 9th and 10th to board trains for the journey south. There they met General Hood, who was recovering from the wound he received at Gettysburg. Hood was determined to rejoin his Texans, so after he bade farewell to the young lady he was courting, he and his horse, Jeff Davis, boarded a train for the journey south. Hood's Texas Brigade did not all show up at once. They actually showed up a day at a time. And the main action occurred with the Texas Brigade on September 19th and 20th. We're here at the Chickamauga National Battleground at one of the three tablets that mark the positions of Robertson's Texas Brigade during the battle. The Vineyard Road is just to our right. Beyond that, the Vineyard East Field. You can see Lafayette Road in the distance behind us. It was here that the Texas Brigade, with about 1,300 men, anchored the left of the Confederate line on the afternoon of September the 19th, 1863. The third Arkansas, commanded by Colonel Van Manning, was on the left, then the first Texas, the fourth Texas, and the fifth Texas, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel J.P. Bain, was on the right. The fighting on September the 19th began on the Confederate right flank. That's the north side of the line and moved south. At about 3 p.m., General Hood ordered Bushrod Johnson to advance to push back Colonel Hans Haig's brigade's attack. About an hour later, after intense fighting, Hood ordered Robertson and Law to move their brigades up. The brigade attacked to the southwest, the 3rd Arkansas and the 1st Texas moving into the Vineyard East Field, while the 4th and 5th Texas attacked through thick brush. Val Giles observed, the underbrush and vines were so thick and interwoven that it was almost impossible to get through, and of course our lines were broken and irregular. He went on to say, Our advance through the deep, tangled jungle was slow. We could see nothing as we groped our way through the wilderness. The 3rd Arkansas and the 1st Texas continued to advance into the vineyard field east under withering artillery fire, while a 4th and 5th attacked across Lafayette Road just over there into the vineyard field west just behind us and routed Colonel Hans Haig's 3rd Brigade. The Texas Brigade really did a good job um, fighting. But one thing about, uh, they noted that the, that the Union soldiers in the Western Theater fought a lot braver and a lot tougher than the, than the Army of the Potomac. A lot of the soldiers from the Hood's Texas Brigade said that the Union soldiers in the Western Theater knew what they were all about, that they were frontiersmen. And they would, did not just run, they would slug it out with them up to the last man and it showed and there was a grudge and respect for those Union troops in the Western Army of the Cumberland. And they said, these men know what they're doing. They were very lethal and they were very tough. And that really was a good observation of an enemy. And they didn't just say that about any, anybody. They said it about the, the, tech, about the uh, Union troops from Indiana and from Kansas and from Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, the highest ranking general from Wisconsin during the Civil War that was killed was Colonel Hans Haig. And he was killed by the soldiers from the Texas Brigade. He unfortunately was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he was actually shot and killed by one of the soldiers of the Hood's Texas Brigade. Don't know which one, but he was. All afternoon, rebels and Yankees surged back and forth across the vineyard field and Lafayette Road. Until at 5.30 p.m., Colonel Luther Bradley's brigade of four Illinois regiments arrived to relieve the Federals which proved too much for Robertson, who ordered the Texas Brigade back across Lafayette Road and into the shelter of the woods about 200 yards east. The brigade had suffered significant losses on the first day of the battle, some say as high as 25 to 35 percent. The night of September the 19th would be a cold and frosty night with no rations and no fires to keep warm. The Texans and Arkansans got what rest they could before the battle would resume on the 20th. On the morning of September the 20th, the brigade moved to their right, that's north, closer to the Brotherton House, and at 11 o'clock in the morning, they attacked across Lafayette Road, taking advantage of a hole in the Union line left when General William Rosecrans moved a division north. The brigade passed the Brotherton Farm and went about 800 yards before they turned north, 
all while under a constant bombardment by federal artillery. And it was the Hood's Tex or Robertson's Texas Brigade that actually went through the gap that was created by in the Union line. And that really helped the Confederates win the victory at Chickamauga. Steady fire stalled the brigade's advance. Jerome Robertson believed that the fire from their flanks was actually coming from Confederates who thought they were Federals, confused by the dark uniforms they'd been issued in August. Finally, the brigade fell back into the woods, where Hood would be wounded in the leg while he talked with Robertson about a counterattack. It was a very effective battle. However, the Rocket Chickamauga, George Thomas, was able to keep it from a complete rout. General Thomas's men were able to stall the Texans and the other Confederate unions to where there could be an effective retreat back to Chattanooga. If it wasn't for George Thomas, it would have been a complete and total Confederate victory. Having apparently shattered the Union Army with a bold stroke of luck, you know, the Union Army having made a mistake, created a gap, and the Hoods Texans poured right through it, Longstreet is adamant that it is time then to drive on to seize Chattanooga before Thomas or anybody else can rally the troops and hold that vital railroad junction on the Tennessee River. Bragg demurs. Bragg says, no, my army is in disarray. I do not know where the parts are. We have suffered heavy casualties. This infuriates Longstreet, who allegedly, and it appears in lots of sources, told someone close by that Bragg had an amazing ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And so Bragg's inherent caution, his focus on lines of support, his insistence upon clean, neat organization and communication froze an already battered army in its tracks, allowing the Union Army time to regroup, get its breath back, and get a new commander in there named Ulysses S. Grant. Thank you.